And what I would like to do this afternoon is to take you on a little bit of a journey, which is a journey about a pathway to business wellness. Now, how many of you are actually happy about the fact that you are in business? How many of you are as successful in your business as you would like to be? <laughs> I think I saw about three hands, okay? That's not uncommon. It's not uncommon. Because the reality that I find is that the majority of people in business are not happy about their success level. And there is a reason for that. And the reason for that is that as human beings, we are naturally competitive. If we know what we want to achieve, we will actually take the steps to actually walk forward. And you know, both Paul and Franz were talking earlier on about energies and the light and you know, Franz's great demonstration of the light. And one of the things that I've come to realize with all the work that I've done helping small businesses is that the majority of people, and I'm going to ask you to put your hands up if this applies to you, the majority of people that I work with are very passionate about their skill, but they're not very passionate about the business. Okay? Why? See, it's boring. <laughs> and actually, some of the elements of it are pretty boring. Business is a separate skill. Interesting. So if business is a separate skill, and I actually agree with you, the business is a separate skill, why would you not learn that skill? See, how many, how many hours, just a few, a few numbers, how many hours have you actually spent learning Reiki? Hundreds of hours, okay? How many of hours have you spent attempting to learn business? Quite a lot. And there will be a few people in the room who have done quite a lot. Okay? But the thing is, you're actually learning, as, as Franz was saying earlier, you, in, in terms of being Reiki and practicing being it yourself, in business you are doing the same thing. One of the things that I think happens is that the majority of people tend to fear business, or more importantly, they actually fear the commercialization of their Reiki. Would that be a fair comment? Okay. The truth is, the business side of it is just another skill. See, if you'd like to have a spiritual business, the reality is you've got to combine the best of your spirituality with the best of business practices, bring those two together, and then you can have a spiritual business. Because if you're all spiritual, like Franz was saying, away with the fairies and all that sort of stuff, and I've seen plenty of those people, okay? <laughs> oh, the universe will provide. Yes, it does. It provides what you need, not what you want. Okay? And business. You know, when I first started business and um, going back, I came out of the corporate arena where I'd been through sales, marketing, strategic management and things like that. And some of the people in the room who've heard me speak before know that I started a thing called Heal Your Healing Business, which I thought was really clever. Okay? The reality was I was going broke faster than the hair practitioners. <laughs> And the reason was that the majority of the business owners at that time thought I was the Antichrist. You know, I, I sort of got the feeling when I went to knock on their doors and there was crosses and cloves of garlic hanging there, you know? <laughs> and the reason for that, very simply, as I said before, is most people tended to separate business and the spirituality and they tended to separate the practitioner's own work or their own skills. And one of the other biggest mistakes that I've seen most practitioners make is if the business is not working, what do they do? Come on, what do you do? When, you know, if your business is not really working well for you, what do you actually go and do? I'll get a part-time job doing something else. Yeah, that's one method, but the most common method is you go and get another healing modality. Okay. So I tell you what, I've learnt Reiki. This is great. Customers are not coming. All right, I think I'll go and learn Bowen. Customers are still not coming, okay. Um, oh, kinesiology, I'll add that to my list. 
And you know, I've seen practitioners who spent literally thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars learning new skills, and they still, excuse me, they still haven't attracted one customer. You can make a very successful business out of one skill. You do not need multiple skills. What we have to do is start to think about our business differently. So to help you with this, this is a model that we play around with. And I would ask you, you know, what's stopping you from having the business that you would like to have? <laughs> so what was, what was the comment from the New Zealand contingent? <laughs> Your wife, okay. <laughs> so putting, putting partners aside, okay. <laughs> What's stopping you from having the business that you would like to have? Yourself, yeah. It's, it's not skills. You can go and learn skills. It's not resources. You can buy those. You can get a lot of those for free on the internet. You know, I was saying to somebody earlier on today, you know, one of the things that I do, and, and Tony mentioned before in the introduction, is I'm involved with a thing called Business Success Radio, where we interview successful people and we podcast that. Um, and we put it up and people you know, pay a small membership and they can access all of the podcasts. Now, at one time, you know, I've got all the software on my laptop and if anyone wants to see it, I can show it to them. You know, that it can actually, I can sit there and I can actually do all of the things about editing software, editing the interviews, putting music to it, and it's all very nice and technical and clever. Okay? I can do that myself, or I can pay somebody 10 bucks an hour in the Philippines to do it for me, which is what we do. And the reason we do that is I can spend my time doing what is most value. Now, the things that's actually stopping you mostly in terms of having the business, the level of wellness in your business that you would like to have is firstly, it is your perspective. Because no matter what your perspective is, one of the analogies that I use is a diamond. If you think about a diamond, a cut diamond, and you look at it from the outside, you can, and I know Paul was talking about with religions and stuff earlier today, you can look at all of the different facets as being different religions, or you can look at those facets as being different elements of a diamond. I would suggest you take the Reiki method and you actually get inside the diamond and start looking from the inside out. That's the perspective. The next thing is that if you're, depending on what your perspective is, that conjures your thinking. Your thinking then determines your attitude. So if you want to change how you feel about your business or you would like to have a more successful business, you've got to change, first off, your perspective. Your perspective of where you are now. There is nothing wrong with where you are now. It is just simply a point in time on a journey. It is where you are. Accept it. And then ask yourself, what can I do differently to change that? I said to Paul in one of the breaks that um, can, he was talking about desire. And uh, coincidentally, well, there is no such thing as coincidence, as we all know. On the plane coming up this morning, um, I was reading Napoleon Hill's book, Seven, um, The uh, Think and Grow Rich. And the first chapter is very much about desire. The reality in terms of your business, and the first question you've got to ask yourself, and I'll be going over five elements which I consider to be the core elements today of how you can actually, which are the foundational building blocks for a successful business. Things that I use and have used with clients to help them with their success. But the first one of those is, is really being clear in terms of what you are, where you want to be. It's having that desire. It's actually knowing it and feeling it. And you guys are good at feeling the stuff. Hey, you know, you practice with this every day. So the first element to do is to sort of change your perspective. Stop, start, stop thinking about the problems 
Now, I remember somebody once told me, you know, you can either have success or you can have excuses, but you can't have both. Okay? So ask yourself a question, am I, am I thinking success or am I thinking excuses, which are the reasons and justifications as to why I don't have the success that I would like to have in my life? I was talking to Elizabeth at one of the breaks as well, and I said to her, you know, she said something, yeah, a lot of these people sit on the fence. And they do, but a lot of people sit on the fence. In my experience, the only thing that you get from sitting on the fence is splinters in your butt. Okay. So are you going to get off the fence and you're going to make a decision? And the decision to make first off is whether you're looking to have a success mental attitude or whether you want to continue on this side of the stage and have the employee attitude. See, the employee attitude is the person who's actually waiting for somebody to tell them what to do, to make it okay. They're the person that's going to provide you with the customers. They're going to provide you with the money. You don't have to think, you've just got to turn up and do the work. Huh? I am yet to meet a successful person who, with an employee mentality in any sphere. However, <laughs> there are aliens in the room. I'll put my hand up. Okay, so what are the most, two most common things that actually stop business success? The first one is a lack of clear goals for life and business. You know, I come to find this out when I first started out in my business practices, you know. I wasn't very clear about what I would like to do, what I'd like to achieve, and how I'd want to do it. And there was a process that I went through. And that process was, um, I don't know whether any of you have read any of the stuff by a guy called Michael Gerber, the e-myth, okay? Part of the process, I, I was very fortunate in a company that I worked with, we actually engaged uh, one of their consultants to come in and take us through the management structures of running the e-myth rather than just you know, reading the book. But one of the key things that he talks about in that is actually you know, getting to understand what your purpose is. And then you can be true to your purpose. And from your purpose, you can then start formulating your goals. And that was the changing point in my life. You know, my, I've, some of you know my story. Um, I came out of um, you know, marriage breakdown, career breakdown, all that sort of thing around about 1990 with suicidal depression, and I had to reinvent myself. And in doing that, I came to realise a lot of the management stuff that I'd been doing, along with you know, personal development that I was doing in my own healing, in inverted commas, um, was all very much aligned. And that's the stuff that I sat and work with. You know, I, I now know that I spend probably 40% maximum of my time helping business owners with their business. The remainder of the time, which is the majority of it, is 60 and sometimes 75%, I'm actually getting them right. It's getting the head right first. That's what gives the success. The second thing is people don't really know what's going on in their business. Sure, we turn up. Sure, we do the work. Yeah, my wife and I have got a shop in the Yarra Valley out of, in, out of Melbourne. And, you know, we can turn up, we can go there, we can serve the customers that come in. And we can do it very well. But how many customers have to walk through the door? How much do they have to spend? How much profit do I have to make out of each one? Those are the things that are about understanding what really makes your business tick. So, who would like five building blocks for their own business success. Yep? Okay, cool. So let's go. How much do you pay me? <laughs> Today? You're getting it for free. Okay, so five steps for business wellness. The first one of those is to know where you are. It's a starting point. If I, if I want to get from here across to the other side of the stage, I've got to have a starting point for my journey. Let me... Ex let me take it a little bit further to highlight this, to use an analogy. How many of you have been on an overseas trip? Majority of people in the room, okay. What was the first thing that you actually decided? Where are you going to go? All right. What did you then do? Did some research. What sort of things did you research? 
weather, accommodation, flights, things to do, costs, all of those sort of things. You created a bit of a budget because you wanted to work out how far that credit card was going to stretch. Okay. For some of you, it's sort of looking at things like, you know, is the place that I'm going to, is it a place where, you know, shopping is cheap and I'm going to take an empty suitcase and fill it all up? Or, uh, pretty expensive over there, I'll take my knickers and I'll wash them. Okay? But before you could go on the journey, you had to decide, you had to have a starting point for that, and the starting point was your lounge room. You knew where you were. Now, in a business sense, the way to prepare yourself is to actually do some sort of an audit and understand where you are as the person. And this clicks into what I was saying before about the mentality that you have, the framework in which you are looking at business, the facet of the diamond that you are looking out through. Is it the employee or is it the successful person mentality? Am I expecting everything to come to me? Am I willing to do what's needed? What are the circumstances? Now some of you, who's, is there anybody who currently has a young family? Yeah, a few of you got a young family? Okay. It's not easy to build a business when you've got a young family. You know? The kids do not understand, do not interrupt, I'm doing a Reiki treatment. You know? Their need is immediate. So one of the key things you've got to look at is in terms of a business, in terms of the journey of your business, um, is that it's going to take you longer to get there. That's okay. Huh? You know, I had one lady in a workshop that I was running who said, you know, oh, you know, the fact that I've got a young family and everything else means I can't do what I want to do. But what she was doing was she was comparing herself to the 40-hour week that she would used to do when she was in a job environment and saying, I can't achieve the same. Well, no, you've got 10 hours a week to spend in your business. Not 40, you've got 10. It just means that it's going to take you four times longer. And give yourself permission to accept that. The next thing you've got to think about is where are you as the business? At what stage of business are you? Are you at the startup phase? Are you in a growth phase? Are you actually at the exit phase? And the last thing is, where are you as the business owner? Have you got the skills, the knowledge, to be able to do justice to your business in the same way that you aspire and you currently practice to do justice to your practice, your practice of Reiki? And if not, what can you do about that? And there are multitudes of ways in which you can do that. You know, it could be going, joining networking groups. It could be going to business programs. Always, if you're going to go for business programs, a little tip, look for the ones that are teaching you practically about how to do business, not the ones who are telling you theoretically what a business should look like. The next part of it is to know where you're going. So going back to the trip analogy, we've got to look at what is my destination? So what is it that you would like to achieve out of your business? My wife and I said before, we've got a, uh, a gift shop in the Yarra Valley, which is just outside of Melbourne. We actually started that business with one customer in mind. Who do you think that might be? I'm hearing tourists, I'm hearing locals. No, no. The person who's going to buy the business. The person who is going to buy the business. It's the only customer that I'm interested in. So all of the other people, the tourists and the locals and everything else that come through our shop and buy product are the people that help us build up the business. They help us build up the reputation, the income, and all, the, all the things that go with that business. But if you have a focus on your business as to who you would like you know, that customer to be, that's part of knowing where you go. So one of the issues that you have as health practitioners, and I had when I was a business coach and just working as that, was that I could not sell my business. And the reason for that is because my business was so reliant upon me. I am the practitioner. Everybody wants to deal with me. 
So the way that I've done that is that I've now, my coaching systems, my, um, I license. So I've got other coaches who now teach the work that I do and run the workshops that I've taken them to do. I can sell that as a going concern. I don't have to be the person in there anymore. You can write books. You can create product. I know Franz is you know, doing courses and training and books and stuff like that. These are all ways in which there is something that is saleable going forward. Because the other decision that you're having is if you haven't worked out how you're going to exit your business, and for some, it may be okay that I'm just going to work this for the next 10 years, 20 years, whatever it may be for you, and I'm just going to stop doing it. That's fine. But think about that at the very beginning. How are you going to get out of what you are going to do? So we've done the overseas holiday thing. The next thing we've got to do is once we've um, had some idea about how we're going to get out of the business, we've got to wrap this together in a big picture for your business. This is where you start to build the desire. This is where you start to build the outcomes. This is where you set the intention. What is it you are looking to achieve? Now, I don't mind, and neither should you, if your intention is solely to say, maybe do some healings on, you know, two or three healings a day, three days a week. If that's, if that's what you would like to do, that is okay. Give yourself position, permission for it to be okay. Not everybody has to be another Richard Branson. Yet in many seminars where you are talking about business, everyone talks about success, about you've got to be all of these great big things, you've got to have multifaceted businesses, you've got to be earning billions of dollars of income and all that sort of thing. Rubbish. It comes down to what is appropriate for you. What is right for you? What is right for your time of life? What is right for your family? But make a decision about what that is. And then it's about really committing to it. Now, one of the issues we have is that when people have big goals, something happens. All those little voices that tell us that we're not good enough, they start chattering away. Okay? And the sad thing is we believe them. It used to be our mum. It used to be the teacher. It used to be the other kids at school that told us all this negative stuff. We don't need them anymore. We've practiced those things so much, we can repeat them verbatim in our heads. And someone once said to me, the best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. Okay? And it's the same with your business goal. And what your mind needs is a framework of how to break this big picture down, whatever it is for you, into manageable chunks. Now, staying with the overseas trip analogy, what we have is we've got, we understand two pieces of information at this stage. We know where we currently are, and we know what we want to achieve. The simplest way to break this down is to think about what does halfway look like? Don't worry about the how am I going to get there stuff. We can work all that out. It's really important to th think about what does the picture look like. Get very clear, crystal clear, particularly about the end goal, the big one. Then you can ask yourself what does a quarter of the way look like? What does three quarters of the way look like? Because as you work with this process, very simply what you do is you know that you're here now at step one. All I've got to think about is how do I get to step two? What are the actions that I have to take to move from here to this next level? And when I get there, I tick the box. I got there. But I don't just move on to the next level and the actions for that. What I'll do is I'll review to make sure that the end goal that I thought about is still relevant to me. Because as we actually grow our experience, then sometimes what we thought we could see as being right changes. So I'll go back to when I was going broke, dealing with all of you guys and all of those other health practitioners. Okay? 
that was, I got to a point. I'd, I'd worked out all the course material, I worked out all the stuff, what I was doing, but I got to here and I was still going broke. So I had to think about and say, okay, what can I do differently? Was my end goal going to change? Was it the right goal for me? And yes, it was. But what I then did was that I looked at it and said, okay, well, how does it need to change? And I thought, well, okay, it's not just health practitioners that need this stuff. Any small business needs this stuff. So I threw it open, changed the name of the business from Heal Your Healing Business to Transform Your Business, doubled my prices and started to get very busy. Go figure. Okay. I'm cheeky. I doubled the prices again to see what would happen. Okay. Funny enough, not much. I did, lo I did lose a few customers. But the majority of the people I had started to actually think differently and work differently because if I was able to charge, I started off charging 75 bucks and I went up to $300 an hour. A okay. $300 an hour, they started to believe I might have something worthwhile to teach them. And they started to take it a lot more seriously. Okay. And they did the work because they wanted to get value out of their investment. Okay. And I'll touch on this again when we come to pricing a little bit further on. So that was how I changed it. Obviously, as we work our way through up, you know, we do the actions, we keep moving. We don't lose sight of the end goal, whatever that end goal is, of what you're looking to create. And ultimately, what happens is when you get up to five and you've ticked all the boxes, five becomes one and you just start over again. The next thing that people don't do that I find often, and which I would encourage you to do, and I now do, is reward your achievements. See, one of the things about being in business by yourself, and as, who, who's actually in business by themselves? Yeah, the majority of people in the room, okay? So if you haven't got a group of people around you, there's not the encouragement from one to, other, to another. And I remember uh, this really came to me one time when I'd done a gig which was writing some training materials for an organisation and the cheque came through and I was like sitting in my home office at the time and I was sitting there and I've got the cheque and it's there and it's in the bank account and I thought looking at it and I think, yes, you know, this is really great because it was a reasonable size cheque and you know, it's, this is really great and my dog's sitting there and she's wagging her tail and still looking at me and she thought she was either going to get fed or go for a walk. Um, <laughs> And I realised, you know, you know what? That's the only celebration. So I made a decision to then go out and I bought something for myself, which was a celebration of what I'd achieved. Now, if I flick back to this slide, what I've now realised the way to go is to set a series of rewards. So this one, once you've got your business at the size and you, you've decided you'd like it to be, this is your big picture. You set yourself a big reward that's commensurate with the achievement, okay? You can go and have a glass of wine to recognise that you're on the journey and then you graduate the size of your rewards for each of the steps commensurate to the achievement. So they start low, they get bigger and bigger and bigger to the best one. It's part of NLP, it actually anchors stuff in, it anchors success in if you celebrate. Don't do what I did though, one time and I had a celebration and um, I'd made, decided I was going to buy something and um, I was procrastinating because I hadn't got time, I'd, all these different things about um, going to get it, all these excuses that I was making about going to get it and it was a gold pen and pen set and um, I was sitting down one day and my wife said to me, she said, yeah, have you bought the pen set yet? I said, no, no, I haven't had time, too busy, da-da-da. She said, okay, she's left it for about a week or so. She said, have you bought the pen set yet? And said, no, no, been, been too busy, I had to go here, do that, all this other work I've got to do. I got to the third time and she hit me straight between the eyes. She said, how many more promises are you going to break to yourself? Thank you. Funny how the pen manifested that afternoon. Right. But the, see, the truth is, if you're going to make promises to yourself, and this is my lesson, carry them through. Because if you don't, how are you going to keep the promises 
that you make to others. Franz talked eloquently about the energy and the and intentions, and you've got to live it to be able to give it, to do it. And it's the same with acknowledging yourself and rewarding yourself. It's important to ensure that you do those things. Okay, the third step for business wellness is to decide your income. Who's guilty for doing what I did for quite a long time is that at the end of the week or month, after all the bills were paid, I worked out whether there was anything left for me. Okay. Anyone can relate to that? Everyone can relate to that? Okay. Most of us have been guilty of that. And there is a period of time within a business when that is quite okay. Okay, it's in the early stages and the growth stages when you're building up your client bases, you expect to do that. All that means is you've got to make sure that you've got some sort of other resource to enable you to eat whilst you're going through that process. Okay? But typically, most people do not decide their income. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. How much money would you like to make out of your health practice? As an annual income, how much money would you like to make? A million. Okay, cool. A year? Cool. All right. There's no reason why that cannot happen. None whatsoever. Most people tend to work on around about 30,000, 40,000, things like that. And they think that it's okay. And for them, it may be. I'm not, I'm not judging it. I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. It may be appropriate to their circumstances. But the truth is, you know, the guys upstairs, as I call them, they don't care how big the number is. You know, there's a quote in the Napoleon Hill book, you know, think, um, think and grow rich. If you ask for a penny, you'll get a penny. And you'll live a penny lifestyle. Is that the lifestyle that you want to live? Because if you ask for more, it'll be there. You just got to believe it and then you've got to do what it takes to actually get there. So I would encourage you all to decide how much money you would like to be making. Now, I don't know um, in New Zealand, but certainly in Australia, I've, uh, in the workshops that I've run, one of the, one of the, when we're doing this particular topic, one of the things we do is we go through an average family budget. And what we find is that it typically takes between eighty dollars and $120,000 per year of after-tax income to uh, for a family of two adults and two kids to live comfortably. And when comfortably typically takes into account they've either got, they've got a reasonable sort of house, two kids are going to school, um, not necessarily private school, they have a holiday once a year, and most likely, like most families, they run a couple of cars. Okay. So it's not an extravagant lifestyle or anything, but it typically takes that. Now the reality is if that's true for you as well, that means that at some point because there may not always be somebody else there to help you pay the bills, at some point you may have to deliver that and earn that yourselves. Now we can all be very frugal when we need to. We don't necessarily need to spend that much money or earn that much money. But I think in anybody who's setting up a business should have an intention of something around that sort of number as the profit they generate out of their business for their business to be considered as successful. Because that gives you a sense of financial freedom. Now one of the other things I would suggest you be very wary of is that oftentimes people, um, particularly your accountants, will tell you that um, in Australia and uh, in other countries, I know there's various taxes, but in Australia um, we've got a thing called GST, where if you earn less than $75,000, you don't have to register for GST. I would suggest every person who is serious for their business should register for GST from day one. I don't care what the accountants tell you. They're working on numbers. I'm working on energy. See, if you turn around and say, I'm not going to register for GST, unconsciously you're saying, I'm not prepared to earn more than $75,000. And it's much easier, and believe me, I can tell you this from practical experience, it is much easier to get used to doing the BAS and the GST statement when the money's less than when it's a lot and all of a sudden you've got to start doing it. You know, it's, it's like your Reiki, practice. 
practice, get it right, get the systems right. So one of the first things that we uh, do when we're playing around with the decide your income is that we've got to do some sort of a budget. How are you going to create a sustainable income? And the best way to do that is to, to uh, come up with a budget. Um, now, I haven't got the ability to show you the budgets of how we do it, but just imagine, who's, who's done cash flows and budgets before? Quite a few people. So for those of you who do it, you'll understand that typically on a cash flow and budget, you've got income at the top, then you've got expenses, and down the bottom you've got plus or minus. I either made money or I didn't make money within a particular period of time, yeah? Okay. I think that's a great analytical tool. But I don't, honestly don't believe it's the best tool to predict what you would need to have happen in your business. So we flip it. We turn around and we put all the expenses up first. Now, sadly, when we do it our way, the expenses list doesn't get any shorter. All right? In fact, it actually gets a bit longer because we add another column on it. And that one is called wages for you. Wages for you. And then we add all of that up. And then the next question I ask business owners is, do you want to grow your business? So how many of you would like to grow your business? Yep, most of you. All right. Where's the money going to come from? See, most people don't plan how they're going to get the additional money in their business. They don't think about it. You know, typically, it'll, it's, it's, the, it's the old spiritual thing. It'll turn up when I need it. No, it doesn't. That's what I call the Tats Lotto method. It never turns up when you need it most. All right. You've got a plan to get it. So one of the things that I suggest you do is that you would add on to whatever your expenses are an element of profit for growth that is a minimum of 20%. When I was doing my consulting business, or coaching business, I should say, uh, we used to run mine on around about 55%. So if you add those two numbers together, that tells you the amount of money it covers all of your business expenses, plus your wages, plus an element to grow your business. That tells you the amount of income that you have to generate. Now you can start working out where's the income going to come from. See, if I look at that number, and let's say it's $120,000, uh, and I've decided that I want to do you know, two Reiki um, sessions, a day, five days a week, that's, and for 40 weeks of the year. Hmm. How many have we got? We've got two by five is 10 times 40 is 400. And I'm charging $100 each, that's $40,000. We've got a big gap between what my budget is telling me we want to get 120000 and my work ethic is telling me I'm only going to get forty. So what this does is gives you the ability to check the viability of your thinking. So you've got, you can then start making decisions about how you are going to leverage your activity. So some of you teach. You know, I, I, can, I can charge you know, um, $100 and, and sit down and speak with, say, friends. Or I can charge each of you $70 and speak to 100 people at one, the same time, in the same hour, but my income is very different. So you can start thinking about how you can leverage what you do, rather than giving up on the fact that you're not going to be able to earn enough money to meet what you would like to achieve. So working with business coaches and things like that can all help you do that sort of stuff. The next thing to understand is that there's four basic ways to grow your business. Okay, the first one of those is to increase your profits. And I'll give you an example out of our shop. We sell bars of soap in our shop that we used to sell for $3.50. Okay. We now sell those um, for $3.95. Okay. Because we found that most other people sold the same bars of shop soap in their shops for around about $4.25. So we sold it for $3.95, so it was still under their price, increased it up from $3.50. We put two full percentage points of profit across our whole business 
just by that small increase on that item. So what that means is you've got to look at your business and look at the things that you sell a lot of or you do a lot of and can you increase your price a little bit which generates a lot more profit across your whole business. You know, there's sometimes there are things that you cannot do. Who feels comfortable about charging for um, what they do? It's interesting, there's about, about half the room who feel comfortable about charging for what they do. I'll come back to that in a moment. The next thing you can do is you can increase the frequency. A guy that I know who runs a massage business does, does this very, very well. What he does is he actually turns around and he gets somebody in and gets them started on a massage therapy program. And most people come to healing practices when there is something acute, there is something emergent, urgent that they want to get fixed. Would that be correct for you guys as well, in the main? All right. So what the massage guy did was very simple. He just turned around and said, okay, let's fix the acute problem. Now, he then asked the question and says, do you have a car? And they say, yep. He said, with your car, do you get it serviced? And they say, yep. Okay, and why do you get it serviced? And it's, well, so as it runs smoothly and it doesn't break down. Okay, so what I'm going to suggest for you is that rather than you having to come back to me when you've got this problem again and it's hurting you like hell as it is now, what we do is we set up a series of quarterly services for you in the same way that you would service your car. He turned his business around hugely to the point where he was booked out for months in advance because not because he was looking for new clients but because he had the regular ones that kept on coming back. Guess what else happened with those clients? Because they were feeling well and continuously feeling well, what did they do? Referrals. Who would like some referrals? Okay. The referrals come from what you do now, not what you're going to do in the future. Okay, so that's one way. Next thing is to increase the value. McDonald's are probably the best of this. You know, would you like fries with that? Would you like a drink with that? Love them or hate them, doesn't matter. Their systems work. How can you increase value? You know, a lot of the ladies might go to the hairdressers and then you know, the hairdresser you know, might be doing a, a colour and a cut or something like that and they're throwing a free um, you know, eyebrow wax or an eyebrow tin and things like that. Now, why do they do that? A, it helps make you feel good, but the second thing is it costs them next to nothing. But there is a value associated with it. And you feel special because you're getting this extra. Now, I'm not sure what it is for your individual businesses, but one of the ways that I would suggest is that you start thinking about how you're going to add value. You know, a guy that I know set up a, a health practice, and he started off by everybody was charging, I think it was $75 for a session for an hour, and he said, you know, my sessions are $90, but for the moment I'll give you a, an hour and a half session. And he did that for the first three months. He then took everybody back to an hour and they were all used to paying $90. They continued to pay the $90. But what he did was in that early stages, he gave value and he gave of his skills. And the fourth one, which is the most dangerous one, is to, dec to de decrease your expenses. This one comes with a caveat. Who's who's been to one? Of, who's been to a restaurant that's opened up, and you go there and you've got you know it's all nice and fresh. You've got a nice full plate and everything else is really yummy. And you think, wow, I want to go back there again. Yeah, we've been to those. Okay, and you've gone back the second time and it's not quite as good. And you thought, oh, maybe it's just an off night. So you go back a third time and it's gone downhill even further. The accountants have got involved. Apologies to any accounts, but the accountants have got in. They worked out that if you actually shrink it down, you may actually make the food last an extra two days or something like that. You can make more profit out of the business. But what you've actually done is destroyed the value proposition of why the people were going there in the first place. Right? That's why I say decreasing expenses 
is fine provided it doesn't decrease the value of the service that you provide. A great way to do that, I used to have a, a phone bill of around about, I don't know, three or $400 a month, which I reduced to $25 a month. Didn't change my phone experience. I just used VoIP internet phones instead of a landline because I was doing a lot of coaching interstate at that time. It's not a bad saving, is it? $400 a month down to $25 a month. Okay. The next thing is, how much do you charge? So what, what, I'm a little bit out of touch with uh, you know, what practitioners are charging in Reiki. What's sort of the charge right now for a Reiki session? $80, yeah? Sorry? 85 Any advance on 85 100 120 Good. Okay, so it's come up. It used to be sort of like, so some of the people were saying $80, and so I was saying 120 How the hell do they do that? Okay. So what is different? No, it's got nothing to do with demographics. Believing in what you do and believing in the value that you offer. You see, one of the things we do when we're, when we're working at our pricing is we actually value our we how on based on how much we think we would pay. We don't think about how much somebody else would pay. I'll use an example of motor vehicles. There is a motor vehicle that's available in India. I can't remember the name of it, but it's about $5,000. Okay, it's basically a lawnmower motor with a couple of seats. Okay, and gets people around. Okay, but it's, it is a car, it is $5,000. Nobody buys them. They would much prefer to spend you know, $100,000 or so on something more like a, you know, a four-wheel drive Land Cruiser, or they'd go and spend you know, higher, press, more prestigious cars, all that sort of thing. Why? Why? Sorry? It, it's partly value, but what else is it? Status. Exactly. See, if you charge cheap, you're actually asking the people who you serve to buy cheap. And one of the biggest mistakes that I suggest that many practitioners make when they first come out of college or come out of school and start to sell themselves is that, oh, I'm only a student, I can't charge very much. I'm not very practiced. You're a hell of a lot more practiced than me that hasn't learned anything. Hmm? Value what you do. Put your mindset, in, mindset into a space of valuing what you do and valuing yourself. And you're more likely to be successful in a financial way. So how much do you charge? As much as you can, appropriately. See, the next part of it is the fourth one, and I'm going to skip through these ones, is a thing called Tell the World, which is, this is all your marketing stuff. And marketing is a huge topic. Right, so I'm going to skip through this, but just a key, some key things. All of us are today's customers. We're more informed, we've got far greater choice, we're more discerning, and we've got higher minimum expectations. Now, if you've got that, that means your customers have got that as well. The question you've got to ask yourself in a marketing sense is, are you actually serving your customers to these new standards. What do your customers buy? Are they buying Reiki? No, they don't, they're not buying Reiki. They're actually buying a solution to a problem. And that solution is that I've got something wrong with me, I want to feel better. But sadly, what happens in marketing, you know, most people talk in what we do. I remember um, I saw Living Now magazine out there before and I noticed that they've taken out the directory listings. But when they had the directory listings, I had a look at that one time and I looked at the Reiki column and there was 25 people um, who had advertised in the Reiki column. Of those 25, 23 of them started with the term Reiki or Reiki master. Like I thought I was going to find a podiatrist in the Reiki column. Okay. You're paying per word. 
Those were telephone listings. There was only one that actually turned around and said, you know, would you like to feel better in yourself? Or words like that. They spoke to the customer about what is important to the customer, not what was important to the practitioner. One of the key things you have to ask yourself is who is the ideal customer? You're not going to be able to satisfy everybody. And I'll give you a little equation that you can write down. It's 20 slash 60 slash 20. And what that stands for is this. Is that in, and this could be happening in this room right now. Okay? And I'm okay with it if it is. 20% right? of, you of your customers are going to love what you are saying and what you are doing. And they will be advocates for you. The 20% at the other end are going to think you're the biggest idiot that ever walked on this earth. Okay? And the 60% in the middle don't care. They're ambivalent. The issue that you have is that most of us tend to spend all of our money, time and energy trying to be evangelists, converting the 60% who don't care or the 20% who hate us into loving us. My answer is forget them. If they're not interested in you, why should you be interested in them? Spend all of your time, money and energy in a marketing sense working with the 20% who get you. Let them be the referrals for your business. Help them bring the customers in. The other thing you're going to have to think about is where does your business fit? All of us recognise these brand names. It's a thing called social comfort and all it means is that each one of these shopping experiences offer something different, a different values. And if I asked you to categorise them, you would categorise them on, on price and experience and all those sorts of things. And you'd be right to do so. But all of you buy at one of those levels where you feel most comfortable, but then so do your customers. So the thing is to ask yourself, are you matching the customer's buying experience with the environment that you are working from and the services that you are providing? Okay, a lot of people want to go online and I'm not going to go into this. There's lots of statistics on it you know, that I can go through, but I'm going to skip over these because online is something that I think every one of us has to do. But the reality is you don't all have to have a website. The key thing though is that when you're going on social media and online, you're going to have a look at all of these different types of social media sites, the names of which you'll recognise. And I'm not going to say to you one is better than the other. They are all great, provided you choose the one where your customers go. So it's no good having a Facebook page if all of your clients are on Pinterest or on Twitter, or YouTube. It's about understanding where your clients go to get information, so those are the spaces to play in. And for many of you, that will be Facebook. But don't go onto Facebook just because everybody else is going onto Facebook. Okay, the last step is manage for success. And there's a number of things you can do. And this takes you through all these things about improving personal productivity. So, you know, you've got to look at the things that, you know, give you the most return in terms of your time and energy. Those are the things to concentrate on. Look at the things that, you know, like us, like me doing the um, editing for, you know, the recordings and everything else. That's low value for me. So that's the stuff you delegate. That's the stuff that you outsource. The other thing is to stop doing stuff. Too many business owners get caught up in doing. You know, I've got to keep busy all the time. And they end up in business with a Y instead of business with an I. And the last couple of these, your calendar. You know, do you use calendars, diaries, and things like that? Yep. Always use a month for you and always set priorities. And some of you might have a daily process for success. If you don't, think about one. So as you do a daily practice for your uh, Reiki, think about a practice for success, something that you can sort of become like a ritual that you go through that sets you up for the day. I'm just going to leave you with four people who can help you. They can, they're available 24-7. They cost you nothing. And some of you may have seen these guys before. They're not mine. They're from a guy called uh, Glenn Capelli, um, who wrote a book called Thinking Caps. And the four Russians, there's three brothers. There's Morov, Lesov, and Ridov. <laughs> and their cousin, Tosin. 
Okay? And the way it works very simply is this. Think about the things in your business that, you, that are working exceptionally well for you. All your life. Because those are the things you need to be doing more of. Think about the things that are taking up the time that still have to be done that you should be doing less of. And how you can actually move those things out to somebody else, delegate, outsource, whatever it may be. And it's not hard to do. I mean, it's, if you think you can't delegate or outsource, it's wrong. You know, I was saying at the break, you know, with our um, uh, outsourcing of the um, uh, recordings and stuff like that, we pay 10 bucks an hour, you know, to get stuff done. It's, it's not that expensive. Okay? The last thing is think about, the third thing, sorry, is think about, as Fran said before, the bottle of water. You know, half full, half empty. Okay? You know, think about the things that are just not working anymore. That could be people. That could be clients. Sometimes it's a great feeling to sack a client. Hmm? You know? And the way that I often do it is I think about somebody who's my main competition that I don't particularly like, and I say, you know what? <laughs> John, I don't think it's working from between us anymore. Maybe Fred down the road can help you, you know? But those are the things you've got to get rid of. All right? Get rid of those influences in your life and in your business that will no longer work for you. Because like the bottle of water, once you actually get some water out of it, you've got the ability to start putting new stuff in, which is where our cousin Tossin comes in. So just to summarise, if you're constantly aware of where you are, where you're going, have decided your income, you get out there and tell the world, and you manage for success rather than to avoid failure, you will create your path to business wellness. My name's Anthony. Thank you. I trust you've got some value. <laughs>